everyone, how's it going? So if you've been on my channel long enough, you know that I really enjoy catching Pokemon, but there is one question I've wondered for a really long time, and obviously it's the title of the video. How many Pokemon can you catch if you never evolve anything? Now, why would this matter? Well, when you think of catch them all, you're thinking of actually catching Pokemon, but a lot of times, because it's faster, I'll simply catch a pre-evolved Pokemon, like a Caterpie, level it up a little bit, and there you go. That's now three Pokemon registered in your Pokedex, when in reality, you only caught one. So for today's video, we're gonna see how many you can catch if you never evolve anything. And for the first time, I filmed the entire catch em all, so I'll be able to take you through the process of how I go about catching all these Pokemon, what parts were difficult, which you guys seem to enjoy, and I'll even have a nice little graphic on the side for you to keep track of how many Pokemon I've caught, so yeah, that's enough preamble. Let's talk about the run itself. So, in the beginning, you get one Pokemon. I decided to pick Bulbasaur because, well, there are a few reasons, but it was the best in the solo challenge, so I figured it deserved to be my starter for this challenge. Unfortunately, you can't catch any of the starters, so that means out of 150 potential Pokemon, and for those of you who've watched my Catch'em All series, you know it's not actually 150, but for now, that's eight Pokemon we're not gonna be able to catch. I'm not gonna mark them or anything because it would just get too confusing, but something I figured I should bring up. Anyway, after you get your Bulbasaur or whatever, you can go and get the Pokedex, and then we can actually start catching some Pokemon. And the first Pokemon most people will catch are Rattata and Pidgey. On Route 2, as you're heading to Viridian Forest, you can catch both of them. Of course, I forgot. This isn't a big deal since they're available everywhere, but funny enough, I ended up going through the whole game without ever catching Rattata. I did catch a Pidgey here, but Rattata wasn't caught until I was double-checking everything right near the end. So, not a big deal since they're so common, but kind of funny. Anyways, we head to Viridian Forest. It's a good time to talk about the planning and strategy that goes into these runs in any generation. So, Viridian Forest, there are five Pokemon. I'm showing you red version since that's the version I'm playing, but it's the same in blue, just with some numbers reversed. So, one Pokemon that we're not necessarily going to catch here, even though I ended up doing so, is Pikachu. And let's talk about why that is. Pikachu is only available 5% of the time in Viridian Forest, but in the Power Plant, it's available at a much higher rate. So it makes sense to catch it there, assuming we have to go since the Power Plant is way out of the way. Well, there are a bunch of Pokemon in Red and Blue that are only catchable in the Power Plant, like Electabuzz, so we have to go there anyway, and thus, while I will catch a Pikachu if I find one, I'm not going to waste time here looking for one if I've caught everything I need. And the other four Pokemon we actually do need to catch here. That's something you have to pay attention to as well. While many Pokemon repeat, there are some Pokemon, like in Red version, Caterpie, Kakuna, and Metapod, that are only going to be found in Viridian Forest. So, I can't leave here until I've caught at least these three Pokemon, although Weedle is going to be caught pretty soon. So, this can take a really long time, and I just want to address that there are ways of speeding this up without using cheats or glitches. As you could figure, we're not using any glitches, since glitches completely change the way you catch Pokemon in Red and Blue. But, you can manipulate the randomness. Uh, it's not very well known, and speedrunners have a whole table you can follow. It's not something I've ever really gotten good at, and frankly, I don't feel like learning it since it just doesn't represent how the average person would have played these games for me at any point. I've never been able to do this. And so, while people are going to comment and say you could have saved a lot of time, because yeah, I did spend a long time, I spent about 40 minutes in Viridian Forest, that's really bad luck, but when you're relying purely on randomness, such things can happen. Anyway, it is something you can do if you're thinking about doing this yourself, but I don't know, I wanted to go for the classic just run in the grass and hope method. It's not the best, but at least it's in line with what the developers intended, which is kind of cool. Anyway, after you've caught those four Pokemon, you can beat Brock and then head to Route 3. Now, Route 3 is three Pokemon, of course we already have a Pidgey, but you can find Spearow, and I do, although it's not necessary, but you need to find Jigglypuff here. Luckily, after I catch the Spearow, I immediately find a Jigglypuff. 10% isn't terrible, but it's not great. But Jigglypuff is only catchable here, so if you forget to get Jigglypuff, you'll have to come back, which is never fun. So might as well catch one right here, and that brings our total to 9 Pokemon 
entering the Pokemon Center before Mount Moon because we can buy a Magikarp. And I get that gift Pokemon are a bit of a gray area, but someone else caught them and then gave it to us, so it was still caught. It wasn't evolved, thus it still counts. And we have 10 Pokemon. We're 1 15th of the way done. Woohoo! Now, funny enough, Mount Moon itself, although you don't have to catch any of the Pokemon here, it's faster to catch a bunch of them, and I end up catching all four available Pokemon. The one you might think is questionable is Clefairy, and let me explain why I caught Clefairy here. Now, even though Clefairy only appears in Mount Moon at a 6% rate at best, the alternative is to spend 500 coins at the Rocket Game Corner, and I'd really prefer not to do that. We're going to need a whole lot of coins later, spoiler alert. And so, it would really save time if I just got Clefairy right now. Thankfully, I did find one rather quickly, and of course, wouldn't you know, it fainted my Bulbasaur and it accidentally hit B, and I ran away. I was very annoyed, but like two encounters later, I got another Clefairy. I have very weak Pokemon since I'm only really training Bulbasaur, since it's just quicker to train up one Pokemon, and Bulbasaur's attack is low enough that I'm usually able to weaken Pokemon, without knocking them out. Another really good reason to pick it. Anyway, I was able to catch Clefairy on pretty high health, which is kind of lucky, but I will take it. And that brings our total up to 14. Now, as we head to Cerulean, there is actually only one Pokemon we're gonna catch for the next little while, and that's Ekans. I didn't actually even need to catch it here on Route 4. I just decided to because I'm not really sure why. I wasn't really thinking ahead, but sure, you can catch Ekans. That brings us to 15 Pokemon, and now we have to fight a whole bunch of trainers, which in this video isn't very important. We're not going to catch Abra, it's too annoying, and every other Pokemon we can catch in these routes, they're just easier to catch elsewhere. So after we've beaten Misty and beaten all the trainers on the way to Bill's house, we can head to Route 6, and on Route 6 I will catch two Pokemon, Oddish and Mankey. Might as well, I'm here anyway, and we need them. Then after I stock up on some more Pokeballs, I can head to Route 11 and catch Drowsy, which is only available there. Now, the Drowsy had put me to sleep, and I did want a Diglett since I wanted something that could no dig, and thus, I just threw Pokeballs at the full health Diglett I found. It was at a pretty low level. I will have to come back here later, so this wasn't necessary, and actually may have wasted time, but... Whatever, I thought I would use it, ended up not being that important, but we got it, so that's good. Because after Diglett, I decided to go and finish up with the SSN, beat Lieutenant Surge, didn't end up using Diglett for that, but that's why I wanted it. But then I proceeded down Route 10 towards Rock Tunnel. On Route 10, you can get Voltorb at 45%, so I picked one of those up. And finally, we've made it to Rock Tunnel, where you might think I'd catch a bunch of Pokemon, but ended up catching actually nothing. Everything that's available in Rock Tunnel is available at a better rate elsewhere in the game. So I could just use Repel and proceed through Rock Tunnel, fighting as few trainers as possible. And once I got to Route 8, in order to skip some trainers, I go through the shortcut by cutting down those trees, and I encountered a Growlithe, so might as well catch that. And so we're heading into Celadon with 21 Pokemon, and as you know from my solo runs, once we get to Celadon, a whole bunch of different avenues will open up, and that's very useful for catching Pokemon. So first, we're gonna head to the Celadon Hotel and pick up Eevee. Then, we're gonna go and get the coin case and find some coins on the floor to purchase an Abra. Way easier than trying to catch one while they teleport away from us. After we have Abra, we're gonna go get the HM for Fly. We're going to catch a Doduo here because why the heck not? Then we're gonna get Fly and we're gonna fly back to Vermilion. In Vermilion, I have my Spearow that I caught all the way back on Route 3, and I'm going to trade it for Ducks, the Farfetch'd. Then, I'm going to go into Diglett Cave and catch a Dugtrio now that I have Great Balls. Dugtrio is pretty annoying to catch with a Pokeball, so waiting till Great Balls made sense. Then we're going to go through Diglett Cave, and we're going to trade Abra for the Mr. Mime. Not that it's super important, but this is a Pokemon we're going to use as our main battler pretty much for the rest of the run. And finally, we're going to head to Pewter City and pick up the old Amber so that we can turn it into Aerodactyl a little bit later. After we've done all that, we have some more plot stuff to do. But one thing I need to make very clear is that in red and blue, you need to make sure you change your boxes. They will not change automatically for you. This is incredibly frustrating. I'm sure so many of us have stories of trying to catch this Pokemon, throwing the Pokeball only for that screen to pop up saying the box is full. It's brutal. I have no idea why they programmed it this way. 
Gold and Silver also doesn't automatically switch boxes, but at least you get a notification when the box is full, so you know to change it. Here, you kind of have to guess, and while the counter wasn't actually working during my run, so I had to just kind of estimate, the fact is I'm at 27 Pokemon, I've made two trades, so I believe there was only one more spot left, which would have been very annoying. Only once did I forget to change boxes. Doing it too frequently isn't that bad, but not doing it frequently enough, yeah, that can be problematic. Anyway, after I finished the Rocket Hideout and beaten Erica, I'm gonna go to the Pokemon Tower, beat rival number four, and then I'm gonna go catch three Pokemon, Ghastly, Haunter, and Cubone. While they aren't super common on the seventh floor, which is the floor with Ghost Marowak, Cubone appears at a 10%, although it does appear 9% everywhere else. Haunter is the big change, appearing at 15%, and it's also not a bad idea to use Great Balls against Haunter as well, because it's an evolved Pokemon, so it's harder to catch. And for those of you who are wondering, you cannot catch Ghost Marowak. We'll get a Marowak a little bit later. Now, after you finish with the Pokemon Tower, I'm going to do something I almost never do and proceed to Route 12, south of Lavender Town. And I'm going to do two things. I'm going to catch Snorlax. There are two of them in the game, so you really want to make sure you catch at least one of them. And we're going to get the Super Rod. Now, in Generation 1, the only water Pokemon you catch via surfing is Tentacool. So a lot of the other water Pokemon we're going to catch need to be done via the rod. It's not nearly as slow as it is in other generations, but it would be nice if we could just press select, like in Gen 2. Whatever, you take the good with the bad. And now that we have the Super Rod, we're going to fly back to Celadon City, and we're going to fish in the pond right by the guy who gives you Soft Boiled. There are both Poliwhirl and Slowpoke there, and they're available in other areas, but it's just very convenient to get them right now. And now that we have Poliwhirl, we can complete another one of the in-game trades. We can go to Cerulean City, talk to this guy, and he will give us Lola the Jinx, another Pokemon we're going to be using. Jinx is super useful because it knows Lovely Kiss, which puts Pokemon to sleep. Sleep isn't nearly as helpful in Gen 1 as it would be in later generations to influence the catch rate, but it still helps a little bit, and it stops the other Pokemon from attacking, which is kind of nice. Afterwards, we can head back to Celadon and proceed down Cycling Road. You can actually catch Raticate in the grass here, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. Then I'm going to go ahead, defeat all the trainers, head to Fuchsia City, defeat all the trainers in Koga's gym, and here is where the run completely grinds to a halt. Man, do I hate the Safari Zone. I've never liked the Safari Zone because it's just so luck-based. There is no sleep moves, false swipe, which didn't even exist in Generation 1, nothing. Honestly, the strategy that works best is throw Pokeballs and hope. And yes, I know they give you the option to throw rocks and to throw bait. Rocks actually double your chances of catching the Pokemon, but also make them super likely to run away, which happens very frequently. And bait makes them less likely to run away, but halves your chance of catching them. Truth be told, you're just better off because they can run away at any given moment. You don't really know what their anger counter is. There's a whole mechanic that's hidden. Just throw Safari Balls and hope. There are a ton, a ton of Pokemon we need to get here, but the worst ones are Kangaskhan, Scyther, and Tauros. Not Chansey. Chansey can be caught in Cerulean Cave. A lot of people, when I made a video way back when talking about the worst Pokemon to catch, I mentioned Kangaskhan. Sure, I could have said Tauros as well, but thankfully, you don't have to catch Chansey here. I didn't counter a few, but couldn't catch a single one. As for what I did catch, there are 50. Teen Pokemon I caught in the Safari Zone, and here they are. We have Execute, Nidoran Male, Rhyhorn, Venonat, Nidorino. Now, Nidoran Female is a little more annoying to catch. They're not very common. Venomoth, a little annoying to catch because of the catch rate. Parasect, same thing. Scyther was pretty frustrating, but I actually caught it very quickly after Parasect, but then it took me another hour and 45 minutes in game until I was able to catch Kangaskhan. The reason for this, and it's the same thing for Tauros, except that took me three hours, is that they only appear at a 4% rate, and when you do find one, you throw a Safari Ball or two and they run away every single time. Now, the 4% rate you actually can get around, what you can do is use Repels. Now, Repels don't allow any Pokemon lower than the Pokemon that leads your party to appear. Since Kangaskhan and Tauros are at a little bit of a higher level than other Pokemon in the area, 
If you have a Pokemon at level 25 for Kangaskhan and level 26 for Tauros, it kind of pseudo increases your odds to around 9 and 7%, but it doesn't actually because you just get encounters less frequently. Still, it's quicker to run around and not get an encounter versus getting an encounter have to run away, rinse and repeat. So it definitely is faster. Unfortunately, it wastes money. And one thing I actually forgot to mention a little earlier is that money is super important because eventually we'd like to get a Porygon, which is 9,999 coins. It's part of the reason why we don't just purchase a Scyther. You're going to be in the Safari Zone for hours. Might as well just catch one while you're there. But purchasing all these repels and then using them wastes a ton of money. And I didn't want to just save and reset because I wanted to see how much time it was taking. And since I did use Retron with speed up, the only way I get a kind of accurate measurement on time is the in-game timer. So if I save and reset, especially because it took me five in-game hours to get these two and they both required repels. But anyway, eventually I did catch the Kangaskhan. Shortly afterwards, I caught a Nidorina and then I decided to go fishing. Dratini is a Pokemon that can only be caught in the Safari Zone. And while I was fishing, I also caught a Krabby and a Psyduck. Dratini is actually the most annoying one to catch because it has a low catch rate and we still can't use Pokemon. Hooray! But after Dratini, I then spent the next 40 minutes of real time or 3 hours of in-game time looking for Tauros. I mean, not looking for, I found like dozens of Tauros, but actually getting one to cooperate was significantly more challenging. But finally, after this entire endeavor, we have caught... 50 different Pokemon, or one-third of the Kanto Pokedex, and that, at least, is something to be happy about. But we still have many more Pokemon to catch. In fact, we're gonna go to Route 15, which is just to the east of Fuchsia City, and we're gonna use Repels to catch a couple more Pokemon, Gloom and Pidgeotto. This time, we need a Pokemon at level 30, because each of these Pokemon only have a 5% encounter rate. With a level 30 Pokemon, there isn't a lot of grass, so it takes a while for an encounter, but at least in this case, every encounter is guaranteed to be one of Gloom or Pidgeotto. The thing is though with Pidgeotto, there is a 50-50 chance the Pidgeotto is going to be level 28 or level 30, so it's actually only a 2.5% chance for Pidgeotto. So once I've caught Gloom, I actually switched to my level 27 Eevee, which will ensure more Pidgeotto spawn, which is what I want, because I was just getting Gloom after Gloom after Gloom. Now, some people might also know Ditto is available here, but it's way easier to catch Ditto a little bit later, especially because I'm spending all my money trying to get coins for Porygon. So I'm going to go ahead and catch Ditto just a little bit later. Speaking of which, one way to get more money for coins for Porygon is to beat all the trainers in Sylph Company. There are quite a few of them. The scientists pay pretty well. And then we can fight rival number five, or rival Fievel, as he is better known. And after we defeat him, we can get Lapras. After that, we can defeat Giovanni and get the Master Ball. We'll use that a little bit later. And then defeat Sabrina, and at which point we can head to Pallet Town to surf the Cinnabar, where there's a whole bunch of Pokemon we can catch along the way. Now, funny enough, I always thought this was in Pallet Town, but it's actually Route 21 right beneath Pallet Town, where you can catch Tangela. I don't know why, I always thought that was so cool that there was this rare Pokemon right where you started, but you just couldn't access it until almost the end of the game. I also messed up here. I could have easily caught a Pidgeotto here. I don't know why I didn't write that down in my chart. One other thing I just want to comment on is another reason Jinx is so great is that it has terrible physical attack and a very weak move in Lick. So I can weaken Pokemon even once I'm very over leveled, which helps because as I mentioned, False Swipe, the best move for catching Pokemon ever, is not available in Generation 1 since it did not exist yet. Anyway, as we surf down to Cinnabar, we can catch Tentacool. And once we've gotten Cinnabar, we can revive our fossils and that will give us Omanyte in my case since it's closer. Yeah, people always ask because it's a Madrive Red thing what fossil I pick. Always Helix. Helix is closer. Thus, I pick Helix. And, uh, of course, Aerodactyl because of the old Amber I picked up earlier. And once we do that, we can head into Pokemon Mansion, and there's actually quite a few Pokemon we can catch here, and Repel Strats are going to be used once again. But I realized I didn't actually have a Pokemon at the level I needed, which was level 37. So I caught a Coughing, a Ponyta, and a Grimer, and I headed back to Saffron remembering 
Oh yeah, the fighting dojo, that's a thing. So I used Bulbasaur because I needed it to get to level 37, eventually defeated all the trainers in the fighting dojo, and got a Hitmonlee. Why? Again, it's closer. With the level 37 Pokemon, I can head back to the Pokemon Mansion, and I can find the much more rare Weezing and Muck. Depending on the version, one is rarer than the other. If you were playing blue, you would also catch a Magmar here, but I'm not playing blue, so we're not going to do that. But now that I have the secret key, I can defeat all the trainers in Blaine's gym. Burglars pay a lot of money, so they're very useful to defeat. And I can defeat Blaine pretty easily. My Pokemon are both pretty overleveled. And to that end, I decided, well, Seafoam Islands, there's a lot of Pokemon I can get there. My team should be able to stall an Articuno until we're able to catch it. Let's head over there. One thing you also might notice I should mention is I'm only using Great Balls as opposed to Ultra Balls. The difference in Generation 1 is incredibly slight. In fact, sometimes Great Balls are better than Ultra Balls. I'm not really sure why that is. Honestly, it's not very important. Great Balls are cheaper, they're half the price, so it just makes sense to use them. So, I get to Seafoam Islands, I find a Golbat, I need one of those, try to catch it, and looky there. My box is full. Told you it only happened once, but oh my goodness, was it a frustrating time, because now I have to fly back to the Pokemon Center, I have to change boxes, and head back to Seafoam Islands. Not the most tedious thing to happen, but was a little deflating. Anyway, now that I'm back at Seafoam Islands, I can use the Repel strategy to get a Golduck, which appears at a near 1%, but is the only Pokemon over level 30, so it's very easy to use Repels and to ensure you get a Golduck, although it may take a while for one to actually appear. But in addition, there are some Pokemon that are either exclusive to the Seafoam Islands, or just much easier to catch there. And we're gonna end up catching eight Pokemon in total, six additional Pokemon plus Articuno. And I actually got really, really good luck finding every Pokemon really fast. I found Shelder, Horsey, and Dugong, which isn't super easy to find very quickly. Not too long after that, I found a Staryu and a Seal, and then Seedra would be another great candidate to use the Repel strategy, but I just found one while I was pushing the boulders to get to Articuno, so Hooray, that doesn't happen to me too often. And speaking of Articuno, I was wrong. It's really annoying to catch. Since we don't have any fancy Pokeballs in this generation, you kind of have to hope your Pokemon are super tanky and can just survive a long time. And because of the way Generation 1 works, Articuno will get a critical hit about 20% of the time. So even with a light screen or something, wasn't really helping. You just kind of have to save and just keep resetting until the Articuno decides it's going to stay in the ball. One thing I actually want to mention here that's cool about Generation 1 is the ball shaking is consistent. So in later generations, sometimes it'll shake three times and be like, shoot, you were so close. Or like two times be like, arg, almost had it. In Generation 1, the amount of times it shakes tells you how good your chances were of catching it at the current time. So in Articuno's case, it would actually say it missed the Pokemon if I didn't put it to sleep and lower its health. Now it just breaks out right away, but if it shakes once, that means I know I caught it. It's kind of a weird but neat little quirk of Generation 1. The funny thing is, this is the closest the games ever get, ever, to telling you what the catch rates are. You know, it's funny, there's a lot more information in Pokemon games, but in this one instance, Generation 1 actually told you a little bit more about the mechanics than any other game afterwards. Pretty weird. Anyways, now that we've gotten the first legendary bird, let's go get the second. So we're going to go to the power plant. We don't have to get Pikachu since I did happen to catch one in Viridian Forest. But we are going to catch Magnemite, Magneton, Electrode, which is very scary because it can use self-destruct and there's only two of them. So you should save because I don't believe they respawn. Electabuzz since I'm playing red version and of course Zapdos. And with that, it's time to head to Victory Road, but before we get there, there's a route that almost everyone just goes right on past, but has tons of useful Pokemon, and that's Route 23. We're actually going to catch 8 Pokemon here, which ties it with Seafoam Islands for the second busiest catching trip. So first we're going to fish, and we can alternate between the good and super rods. With the good rod, we can find Poliwag. And then I switched the Super Rod because why not and caught a Kingler. Switched back to the Good Rod to catch a Goldeen. And then caught a Slowbro and a Seeking. 
and that's all for fishing. Then in the grass, which people usually skip, we can catch Ditto, way more common here, and we can catch Firo. And finally, although it's a little harder to find, we can catch Arbok. And that brings our total to 84 Pokemon. And there's actually a bunch of Pokemon we're going to catch in Victory Road itself. Some are exclusive to Victory Road, but others are ones I could have caught in Rock Tunnel, but are just far easier to catch now since I have great balls and more powerful Pokemon. And on that note, the first Pokemon to catch is Golbat, which is much easier to catch now that I'm actually allowed to catch Pokemon. <laughs> but we also catch Machop, Graveler, Onix, Machoke, and Marowak. Before we try and catch our final Pokemon prior to battling the Elite Four, Moltres, and maybe as a way to make up for the Safari Zone just a little bit, I caught Moltres in the first Great Ball I threw. And then I beat the Elite Four, which usually is such a long and dramatic thing, but in a catch em all is an afterthought. And the reason I mention that is after you beat the Elite Four, you can enter Cerulean Cave. But before I do that, there's one Pokemon I've been trying to get for hours now, Porygon. Do I have enough money? No. Even after all this, I still don't have enough money. Thanks very much, Safari Zone. It really did make a difference. So I'm going to have to battle the Elite Four again to get more money. I also need Great Balls and Max Repels. Annoying, but not the end of the world. But after defeating the Elite Four again, I can just buy the coins I need, right? <laughs> no, no. It doesn't let you go over 999, you silly, silly person. So, of course, I have to go to the slot machines to make sure I have the right number of coins. In this case, 9,949 so I can buy 50 more coins and finally get Porygon. It's not even that good. Why did they make this thing so difficult to get? I will never know, but we have one now. And after that, I figured it was a smart idea to look through the Pokedex and see if I missed anything. And it turns out I missed a couple Pokemon. Rattata, which I mentioned all the way in the beginning of this video that I'd forget until the very end. And Lickitung, which is an in-game trade that I've actually never done before. The NPC is located just west of Fuchsia City, and I always just trade one in from gold and silver, so I didn't actually remember where the NPC was. And now we just have one more location to go, Cerulean Cave. It's why we had to beat the Elite Four. Obviously, we're going to finish off with Mewtwo, but there's still quite a few powerful Pokemon we can catch along the way. There's Dodrio, Hypno, Chansey, see, way easier to catch it here, Rhydon, best Pokemon ever, weirdly asymmetrical Wigglytuff, like, I don't know what they were thinking with this sprite. And finally, Raichu. That is every Pokemon you can catch in red and blue. Of course, excluding Mewtwo, who we will catch in the Master Ball. And so our final total within one single game is 102. If you were to add blue version and reset once, you could bring that number up 13 to 150. Pokemon. And so, that leaves just 35 Pokemon you cannot catch without evolving if you were to just use Red and Blue. Funny enough, many of those Pokemon have been made catchable over the years, and at this point in time, only 4 of the original 150 Pokemon have never been made catchable without evolving. And they are Blastoise, Venusaur, Kabutops, and Omastar. Every other Pokemon at some point in this game's history could be caught without evolving. So that's it for this video. If you like this concept, let me know. I wouldn't mind doing this in other games or other generations. The other thing I'm curious about is whether you enjoy seeing me catch every single Pokemon, or did you prefer the old way where I just sort of talked about it in abstract? I figured this would be a little more visual, but let me know in the comments. Anyway guys, I love to keep videos under half an hour for no real reason, other than it's an arbitrary number. And depending on my editing, it's going to be very close, so thank you for watching. Take care everyone.